cheese, one of life's greatest culinary pleasures, comes in a variety of tastes, shapes, and textures. According to one estimate, there are over 1,500 types of cheese, ranging in size from the tiniest little goat cheese to a 1,250 pound wheel of cheddar, said to have been a wedding gift for Queen Victoria. Well, first, today, I'm going to show you how easy it is to make fresh cheese, a fluffy, rich, fresh ricotta that's so good, you'll be tempted to spread it on just about anything. And here's an idea for your next party. Try serving fondue. It's made in the traditional Alpine fashion with a combination of melted cheeses and a splash of kirsch, a cherry-flavored brandy. And you won't believe just how simple it is to make my favorite recipe for fettuccine. Three ingredients, that's it. Next, how to serve raclette, a melted cheese specialty from Switzerland. And last but not least, grilled cheese sandwiches just aren't for kids. When you add ingredients like fontina, prosciutto, and pears, you've upped the ante to grown-up grilled cheese. Many of us are cheese enthusiasts these days, and learning how to make your own cheese at home is something that I want to know how to do it. So I thought I'd teach you how to make ricotta at home. And it might just take less time than going to your local store to buy a tub of it. So we start first with eight cups of whole milk. And I always buy nowadays milk that is marked organic. And one and a half cups of organic heavy cream. One teaspoon of salt. And turn on your heat, uh, sort of medium high. And after this mixture reaches 195 degrees, add one quarter of a cup of fresh lemon juice. Now I find the easiest way to squeeze lemons is cut off the two little ends. And to get a quarter of a cup of lemons this size, these are tiny. It'll probably take at least two lemons. And you can easily squeeze the lemons in this handy little juicer. Now strain the juice. You don't want any seeds and you certainly don't want any lumps in your ricotta. And you know, don't throw these away. Throw them in a pitcher of iced water. Uh, it'll flavor the water and it'll be so healthy for you. So now our milk and cream mixture is 195 degrees. Add your lemon juice. And I'm just taking it off the hot stove because you want this to sit for five minutes. The lemon juice is acting as a coagulant. You can see already that curds are forming. So five minutes that really needs to form as many curds as possible. So Look what's happened. It has really curdled and forming those delectable ricotta curds. Now spoon this gently into cotton cheesecloth. Put right over a bowl. And this stays for 20 minutes in the cheesecloth while all the way the watery side product drains through the cheesecloth into the bowl below and the ricotta is left in the cheesecloth. And really, that's the process of making your own homemade ricotta cheese. And while this is draining, I'll show you how to make a rhubarb compote that tastes really, really good with the ricotta. This rhubarb is right out of my garden. It's a beautiful red variety, a, a young variety. I like the small stalks. Sometimes you get rhubarb that's about that big around and uh, it can be a little bit tough. This is sweet and delectable. Cut off the ends. This is an unusual vegetable that's considered a fruit. Rhubarb is botanically speaking um, a vegetable, but with the addition of some sugar, and a pie crust or a crumble topping, it does make a beautiful dessert. So cut this into like half inch pieces. And you notice how I'm gathering all the stalks into one little pile and then cutting. This saves a lot of time. The leaves of the rhubarb are very big and very showy, but they contain oxalic acid, making them toxic. 
uh, and you should not bring those even into the house. Just leave them in the compost heap outside if you pick your own rhubarb. So if you have a deer problem, you can plant a lot of rhubarb and the deer will not touch the rhubarb. And so I have two tablespoons of water in my pan. Put all the rhubarb into the pan. And for this amount, which is a little less than a pound, 10 ounces, add two thirds of a cup of sugar. If you were using a whole pound, I would say a cup of sugar. It's very tart and does need sweetening. Let it start to simmer and just let it stew. It is delicious. So the rhubarb is tender. It's cooked sufficiently and let it cool. You can chill it or just bring it to room temperature. And now I'll show you how to use your ricotta and the rhubarb. Here is the ricotta after 20 minutes. It's still jiggly and still dripping. If you want a denser ricotta, here is one. This is about an hour in the refrigerator, so it's chilled. It is much denser, and you can just turn this ricotta out into a bowl. Creamy, luscious, delicious. That is what homemade ricotta looks like. So if you like, take a couple of spoons of this and top it with a little bit of that pretty, oh, so pretty, rhubarb compote. And there you have a delectable dessert. Rhubarb topped homemade ricotta cheese. You've got a fruit and cheese plate all in one. Well, now that we've left the little dairy on an Italian farm making our own ricotta, now I'm going to show you uh, how the Swiss make fondue. I think fondue is just one of the most delightful ways to enjoy cheese. It's a heavenly melted cheese dish originating in Switzerland, somewhere in the mountains. And uh, traditionally, several cheeses are combined and served communal style out of a pot, kind of like this, and eaten with speared cubes of bread. As tradition has it, if a woman drops a cube of bread into the fondue, she has to kiss all the men in the room. If a man drops the bread cube, he has to buy a bottle of wine. If, oh, by the way, and if the person drops the cube for a second time, he must host the next fondue party. So it all sounds like lots of fun. And making fondue is extremely easy. So pour one and a third cups of white wine, a good white wine, a nice hearty white wine, into your fondue pot. Now notice this fondue pot is narrow for its height. It is a typical shape and it holds a lot of fondue. Now I'm cubing up the cheese, Gruyere and Emmentaler. And uh, both of these are very nice Swiss cheeses. And cube, oh, like quarter inch, half inch cubes. The smaller they are, the quicker they melt. And the quicker you can enjoy this dish. Melted cheese at its best. So we have Emmental. This is the Emmental, and that is the Gruyere. Put those together. And to the cheese, add two tablespoons of flour. This helps thicken the mixture. Uh, as it cooks, a quarter of a teaspoon of white pepper. Don't use black pepper because it will kind of make this speckled and it's pretty when it has uh, just pure yellow. An eighth of a teaspoon of cayenne pepper and stir this together. And there's no salt in this recipe because the cheese has a saltiness all of its own. So there we have that all mixed. The wine has come to a boil and add the cheese a little bit at a time. Adjust your heat too so it's not too high. And you can use a wire whisk or a wooden spoon to stir. You want really smooth mixture, flavorful. It melts quickly. In order to keep the cheese from forming clumps while it's melting, always stir it with a spoon in a figure eight pattern. See what I'm doing here? Forwards or backwards figure eight. Oh, it's really melting nicely. Now you can add the rest of the cheese. Emmental is a cheese from Switzerland made from cow's milk. It's sometimes called Swiss cheese in the United States. However, not all Swiss cheeses are Emmental cheeses. 
Gruyere cheese has a rich, a sweet, nutty flavor that's great for cooking, great for melting, and it's used in omelets, but it is especially delicious in beautiful fondue. Now, one tablespoon of kirsch. This is the cherry-flavored liqueur. And we have a wonderful, fully melted, smooth, and creamy fondue. Now, to keep this from solidifying, we want to put this right on the special fondue heater. And you just light the mixture that's in there and put your fondue pot right on top. This will keep the mixture at the right temperature. Last but not least, two teaspoons of lemon juice. Mmm, ready to try. Now, traditionally we skewer the bread on these long forks. And I like whole grain bread like this. And dip and twirl. And be very, very careful for a good etiquette not to touch your lips or your tongue to the fork. Uh, not only might you burn yourself, but you're also being more considerate of everybody else dipping into the pot. Mmm, so good. A great dish. Try it. Now here's a recipe for a simple fettuccine Alfredo. I have one pound of fettuccine in a generously salted pot of boiling water. We have a half a pound of Parmesan cheese grated and a half a pound of good quality unsalted butter. This goes right into the bowl of your electric mixer. Just mix that up with the half a pound of Parmesan cheese. As the story goes, fettuccine Alfredo was invented by a restaurateur in the early 1900s, and it was a simple pasta. It became very famous a little later on when Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford visited Alfredo's restaurant on their Italian honeymoon. After eating his concoction, the couple brought to Alfredo a golden fork and spoon in honor of his pasta. You won't believe how simple this pasta is to make. And I don't know if it deserves a golden fork and spoon, but it certainly enjoys your attention. So just mix the Parmesan and the butter. And you can add a little bit of black pepper if you like. So that's that part of the recipe. Rather simple, don't you think? No cream, no milk, no eggs. This is a three ingredient plus a little salt and pepper recipe. And the pasta is boiling. Just get this scraped off the beater. If you want pasta tonight, this is a really, really good and simple recipe. So here's your softened butter and cheese. Waiting now for the pasta to cook. This beautiful fettuccine, dried fettuccine, has a good, what they call tooth, has a nice texture. And that takes about 10 minutes. Have your colander set up in your sink for draining. And before you drain, save at least one cup of the pasta water. So I think the pasta is done. It actually took a little bit more than 12 minutes to cook. Now I've saved the water. I'll drain the rest. Be careful of your feet. Don't splash. And if you were planning to have a facial, you don't have to. This is the ultimate in facials, by the way. All this great steam on your face. Don't rinse. So now put it right into your cheese and butter mix and toss. All of that cheese and butter will melt right into this beautiful pasta. And you can add a little bit of the pasta water, just a quarter of a cup to loosen it up. And this is a wonderful, delicious comfort food. 
Mm, I think this is exactly what we're looking for. Fettuccine Alfredo. Pour it into your serving dish. It's creamy and moist, delicious. You can serve it with a little bit more grated cheese. And so here you have it. Eat it while it's hot. It's the ultimate in Italian comfort food. Fettuccine Alfredo. When Swiss cow herders moved their livestock between pasture and mountain, legend has it that they would set cheeses out near their campfires until the cheese began to melt. They would then scrape it little by little onto bread for their evening meal. Today we may use a machine sort of like this to do the melting, but the results are just the same, totally divine. Uh, let me show you how it's done. I'm just taking off a little bit of this raclette rind just so that when the cheese melts, I can just take it off and put it on my potatoes. When I first tasted raclette, I, I think it probably was in Switzerland, I came right back home, and because I had a fireplace, I put a piece of cheese on a piece of soapstone right in the heat of the fireplace, and it made delicious raclette. So you can improvise. You don't have to have a machine like this, but it certainly simplifies matters. Just take a little bit of the rind off to start. This way we're gonna have a nice clean melt. There. And this fits right onto this. There's little prongs to hold the cheese and then this goes right to the melter. This is a heat lamp and it's going to very gradually melt that cheese to exactly, hopefully, <laughs> the right consistency. Have ready either some toasts or we have some beautiful fingerling potatoes cut in half and oven roasted. These are so beautiful and very tasty for a cheese raclette. And I can see that it's just starting to melt. You can move this in even a little closer for a quicker melt. There's quite a few companies making raclette heaters like this. And if you like to do this and have a ski a lodge or um, a weekend a house in the mountains, this might be a good investment for you. Otherwise, just put it on a stone and put it in front of your fireplace. That radiant heat is what you want to melt the cheese. So just put some potatoes on a plate like this and use a spatula. You have to figure out which spatula works best for you. And you see how nicely this cheese melts really quickly. Just put it onto a potato, a piece of toast, and serve while it's still hot and moist. This is a really nice way to enjoy a cheese called raclette. Raclette cheeses uh, come in wheels. This is a quarter of a wheel of a 17 pounder, which would be rather large to put under this little iron, but mm, what a tasty cheese. Raclette cheese, by the way, is made from whole cow's milk and the better ones are from the milk of cows that graze up on those higher pastures in Switzerland on grass, and brilliant green grass. Oops, I have to work fast not to lose the cheese. And what a fun way to enjoy a melted cheese. Have fun. Adored by young and old alike, the grilled cheese sandwich as we know it is commonly traced back to the 1920s when both sliced bread and processed sliced cheese were invented. With its everlasting popularity, setting up a grilled cheese bar at your next party is sure to be a hit. So this is how I would set up a simple grilled cheese bar. Breads that are appropriate for grilling, prosciutto, bacon. These are those little papadous, some dill pickles, tuna, sardines if you like, avocado, tomato, onion, pears or apples, some fig jam, some mustard, butter and mayo. Oh, and don't forget the cheese. Cheddar, fontina, and gruyere would be my choice. And we have this great grill pan. You could put four of these on a stove and have enough heated surface to make grilled cheeses for a party. So, um, mustard, 
for this first sandwich. Mustard is good on grilled cheese. And now this is something that I would typically make at home. A mustard, um, I would do cheddar. Cheddar and tomatoes. Now, that's a lot of cheese, but I think a lot of cheese is good. So you can break the cheese too, like that. Two slices of cheese, there. Bacon, I adore bacon on a sandwich. And what I think is good in a, in a grilled cheese sandwich is that there's some of everything everywhere. I don't like to bite into a partial stack of stuff. And some tomato. And maybe two more slices of cheese. That will hold it together. And then another little bit of mustard. Not too much, you don't want to drown the sandwich. And a little mayo, too, is very good on grilled cheese. So that is one grilled cheese sandwich. And very important is to butter the bread. And the bread should be thick enough so that it's crispy on the outside and soft on the inside, but not so thick as to bury the contents. And uh, the butter should be kind of room temperature and completely coat the exterior of the bread. So you just get that right on your warm griddle pan. And just let that start to melt. For a white bread sandwich like this, I think I'll do fig jam and pear. That sounds like a good combination. More sweet sandwich. So a little bit of this lovely fig preserve. And let's use Gruyere, which melts delightfully well. And some sliced pear. And a little bit more fig jam. And as I'm not putting so, so much that it's gonna drip all out, and one slice more. There, again with the butter. So the bread, we have just a pan de mie, which is a basic white loaf with a nice crust and it's square shaped, which is very nice for grilled cheese. And we have this beautiful country loaf, kind of a pan segla. And we have a more heavy whole wheat loaf. Very pretty too. That'd be good as a tuna cheese melt. So here is one sandwich. Now you can cut this into edible sizes. It's a big sandwich to put in one's mouth. So this beautiful pan segla really should be into three pieces. And this can go over here. And then our tuna melt, which looks so amazing. Slice this in half. Oh, so good. Mm. And this can go, i just put it prettily right here. And our lovely apple cheddar. Let's slice this on a diagonal. So this party idea will certainly make your guests melt. Thanks for joining me today, and I'll see you on the next episode of Cooking School. Eat those sandwiches while they're hot. Break goat or feta cheese into large chunks and place in a small oven-proof dish. Drizzle with extra virgin olive oil. Top with your favorite herb. I like to use fresh thyme. Sprinkle with a half a teaspoon of crushed red pepper flakes and a half teaspoon of whole pink peppercorns. Transfer everything to a 325 degree oven and bake 15 to 20 minutes. Serve warm with a sliced baguette or crackers.